Awesome. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jane. We're going to be going through some single cell RNA sequencing workshops today, uh, this morning and this afternoon. So I want to first start, of course, by acknowledging that the land we're gathered on today is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And as someone lucky enough to have chosen to move here, and as a settler by descent, it's important to respect where we are today and feel grateful for it and to give back to it when we can. And by this point in the series, when you've seen the slide, it's just about our copyright information. All right, so for today, um, to get started, we're gonna be focusing on um, these key steps. We're gonna be looking at the Cell Ranger software, which is run and put forward by 10X Genomics. Um, this is our outline for today. So first we're gonna hit the ground running by getting some workshop, preparing some workshop materials. And then we're gonna go into the background of droplet-based library preparation. And then we'll finally go into um, the nitty gritty about the Cell Ranger software. All right, so now if you could please run uh, these two lines, um, run the script in the folder if you're on Sockeye, which everyone should be logged in onto Sockeye by this point. Um, this first line, you're just gonna make a directory if you don't have this made yet. And so you can type this out into your command line and it's going to make a folder with your name in it under student spaces. Once that's made, I'm gonna have you change into that directory with this second line here. Give me a thumbs up when, oh. <laughs> um, can you give me a thumbs up once you guys are done so I can get a sense of everything that's finished? This applies to Zoom too. All right, we've got one person done. And we've got TAs monitoring the chat as well to troubleshoot. Perfect. And again, just give me that thumbs up over Zoom if you haven't yet. I've only seen one. I've seen one in person. Okay, I see one from King. All right, quickly give me a thumbs down if you're still working on it, please. Copy the on the second one? On the second one, I think it's missing the user code. So you have to make it first. So make the directory. Yeah, I have. Yep. And instead of user, you can type in your name. No, no, you no, it should be user. user. Yeah. No, it should say your next slide. Yeah, people have moved on. People have moved on? Okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it should be CPR. Okay, great. Thank you, Irvin. Um, so when I fix this earlier today, you should do CP dash R and then the file path in that second line. So that way you're copying a directory over. There's an error with the file path. Also, it doesn't see user. Are you? Oh, oh I see. Next. next slide. Okay. All right, we're going to keep moving forward. And this is still flashed up so you guys can see it. So once that's you've changed into that directory, you're going to copy the single cell RNA sequencing um, environment. And there's no, yeah, there's no workshop materials folder. So that actually needs to be updated. So the correct file path is going to be um, exactly what Urban said. I'm just going to put it into the chat here. It should just be, oh, I can't copy that. It should be CP R and then project. ST STIR v1, Precision Health Virtual Environment, Workshops, SCRNA Seek, and there should be no workshop materials. Just leave that part off of it. All right. Thumbs up if that's clear and if you were able to do that. So it should be Project ST STIR v1, uh, Precision Health Virtual Environment, and then SCRNA Seek dash. No, not workshop materials, not workshop materials. So everything but workshop materials. All right, now this is critical. So once you guys have this done, definitely give me a thumbs up because I do want to make sure everyone gets this properly, uh, properly put in. Oh my God, I like this. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Kate. Sorry. All 
All right. So once you've moved into the single cell RNA sequencing folder, uh, view the contents and give me a thumbs up that you can see these uh, six files. So Cell Ranger, Data, get rstudio.sh, install rstudio libs, uh, run rstudio and sc process. You might see a few more, but these are the five that you absolutely need. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Thumbs up. Good. All right. Zoom people, thumbs up if you have this. Awesome. I see two. Okay. I'm going to trust that we're going to, we've got this good. Okay. Our three responsive people are good. Great. All right. We're going to keep moving forward. Um, so now we're going to get the data that we need for our workshop today. Um, so you're going to change into that data folder with that first line there, CD data. You're going to list the contents. It should just be one single script um, that says get scdata.sh. And then finally, you're just going to run sh get scdata.sh. Okay. Um, so in the first one, it's basically just saying we're going to run the shell script that I've already written. Okay. So it's reading that shell file. Okay. So like, uh, like when you're reading the nano file. It's a bash script. Okay. Thumbs up that this is all running for everyone. Great. Awesome. Online, Zoom people. Awesome. Fetching data on the head, on the login. We're not using you. Oh, so it's like that's Okay. Awesome. This is running on the login. So the SH versus two seven twenty word version. Yes. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move forward now. Uh, while this all downloads, this is going to take maybe half an hour, hopefully not as long, but we're going to go into some single, some background on single cell RNA sequencing. So our learning objectives for today are number one, to understand the key steps of single cell RNA sequencing from the bench to the bioinformatics because they are intertwined, of course. And step two, or basically our second learning objective is to set up and run the Cell Ranger make fast queue and count pipelines on our sockeye, um, on sockeye. So you might have heard of single cell RNA sequencing before. You might have done it. You might have looked at the data and browsed around. You also might have seen it in a bunch of publications recently because it is a very popular, um, exciting new uh, way to do transcriptomics. Um, so single cell transcriptomics is a tool that examines the gene expression level of individual cells and applying this method to controlled experiments can therefore uh, lead to a lot of new findings because you're not just looking at all the RNA from a bunch of different cells, uh, you're looking at it at each individual cell. So when you're able to see it for different cell types in different conditions, uh, you get new insight on what these cells are doing when exposed to different conditions. It's really good for heterogeneous um, cell types, so samples that have a bunch of different cell types that might be expressing very different things. So next, we're just gonna give a very high level overview of one common kit used to create single cell transcriptomic data. And it, this is a droplet-based uh, workflow and it's using a 10X kit. So to capture and label single cells, 10X uses this microfluidic chip um, that you can see on the left here. Can you see? Perfect, you can see my mouse. Um, and it uses this chip that is loaded um, and then run on a machine. Um, inputs to the chip are gel beads, which you can see here, um, your cells with an enzyme that's in a master mix, and then partitioning oil. So cells are fed through this microfluidic channel up this way and merged in with the gel beads coming from another direction and each cell kind of attaches to one of these gel beads and flows forward into the partitioning oil. Um, so the partitioning oil basically creates a little bubble around each gel bead. Um, there are way more gel beads as well than bubbles or than cells. So by a matter of odds, um, you're going to get about one cell per gel bead, um, but then there'll also be quite a few empty gel beads. Uh, once they're in this little bubble with a gel bead and a cell, that's called a gem. And that's a 10x thing, gem. It stands for, something? It stands for like gene expression, um, gene expression in emulsion, I believe. It's not a direct acronym. Um, yeah. So once each 
gel bead. Uh, so each gel bead contains these little, um, basically, oligos that are attached to it, um, hanging off the ends of it. So when a cell tags onto it, um, these little barcode and UMI um, sections of these oligos um, are going to then be reverse transcribed onto the mRNA of the cell. So uh, these unique sequences um, of nucleotides on the UMI, uh, this stands for unique molecular identifier. And so these unique molecular identifiers are then used to label the mRNA that's within the cell. So the cytosol, cytosol mRNA that's floating around there. So once the gels are collected from the chip, mRNA from the cell is reverse transcribed to create complementary DNA or cDNA, indicating the gene sequences that gave rise to the mRNA. I'm probably gonna flip between using cDNA and mRNA interchangeably today, just as a fair warning. Um, but basically, we're looking at the mRNA that was then reverse transcribed to cDNA in our library preparation process. So what we're actually reading when we sequence things is going to be cDNA, um, and it's cDNA that DNA genes that basically gave rise to mRNA. So we're missing some part of DNA because we're only looking at things that made it to the next step of mRNA in these cells. Is that clear? Good, all right. So during the reverse transcription process, the cell-specific labeling occurs. UMIs from the gel bead um, that was in the same bevel from the partitioning oil are then appended to the cDNA. And then the partitioning oil is removed um, and all the barcoded cDNA fragments are pulled together. At this point, we know what cDNA came from which cell. Okay, so we've got the cDNA per cell labeled. So to differentiate between samples though, we have to add a sample specific index barcode as well. So to summarize this one more time, just with two samples instead of one, uh, each single cell suspension sample is loaded onto its own lane on this microfluidic chip, along with the gel bead and the partitioning oil. Each sample is then kept separate as they um, get made into those little gems. And then from that process onward, it's still kept separate until we can actually label them as separate samples. So at this point, they're labeled at the cellular level and then we label them at the sample level. After samples are labeled at the sample level, they can be pulled together for sequencing. And since this, uh, after this is done, we can identify which mRNA came from what sample um, down the line computationally and due to that index sequences on the cDNA. So we're able to parse out for each strand of mRNA for transcriptomics now, which cell it came from, as well as which sample that cell came from and that mRNA came from. So the next step is to then, of course, sequence your samples. Um, during the sequencing process, base calls are made and sorted for every cycle of sequencing in the form of individual base call files or BCL files. So now we're getting to where our dry lab workshop is going to begin. Um, usually if you outsource your sequencing to maybe the BRC at UBC, you actually don't have to do this um, cell ranger step. Um, they will do it for you, which is very nice. Um, however, if you're generating your own data and sequencing it for yourself, you do. Um, or if you're doing a secondary analysis and starting with FASTQ files that you download um, from a repository, then you will do um, the second step, which is the cell ranger count function, because you already are starting with these FASTQ files. So then you will use cell ranger if the protocol used 10x genomics's protocol for this. So without further ado, um, I'm going to show you the process of aligning the raw sequence reads and getting outputs to make a gene expression matrix um, using the 10x genomics cell ranger software. So this runs on our server on the on sockeye and these are the requirements for cell ranger pipelines so you do need to be you do need to have access to high power computing um, and this is just a schematic of how this works with cell ranger and how it gets um, distributed so when sequencing is complete the base calls and the bcl files must be converted to sequencing data so we convert sequence reads from bcl files to fastq using this make fastq function which is nice and intuitive in terms of naming. The output is a directory of FASTQ files for each sample. And the name that you give it um, as part of this function 
will put the name of that library. It'll append it to the start of the FASTQ file name, okay? And that way you can differentiate between the samples. All right, so I'm just gonna go back here one more time. Does this make sense for everyone so far? Awesome, all right. So we're gonna go see if our data is downloaded yet. It might not be. Um, so if you guys could quickly um, check the data, can you can you give me a thumbs down if your data is still running on Zoom, if you're still downloading it? That's a thumbs up. Okay, thumbs up. Yours is still downloading. Yours is good. No, it's still downloading. Okay. Yeah, I'm still downloading. All right, data still downloading. That's okay. We we're gonna. Data on the service, we? we do. Yeah, Why we can we keep going through it. Oh, what do you mean copy it over? Yeah. They could do that. Yeah, it would also take a while, I think. But it would be faster. Okay. I didn't want it all on the server, but okay. They could. It's not on the I can list out the file path where they can get it. It's on Scratch. Um, I mean they're already downloading it right now, but yeah, we could do it with that. So do you want me to have them end that? Um where's your terminal? Oh, we we're only seeing your slides. You only see my slides. I can pull up my terminal right now. Yeah, who's in the terminal? Uh, how, how close is it to being finished? It doesn't usually take that long. It usually takes like 15 minutes. So I kind of budgeted more time, but. Yeah, mine is done. Yours is done? All right, yeah. People, sh it should be kind of just yeah. about, yeah, people are done now. Yeah. Yeah. This is a great time. If anyone has any questions about single cell learning sequencing, you can ask can them. You, can you go back to the web yeah. lab? Which part? Um, when you're reverse transcribing. Yes. Okay. Wait, no, forward one. Uh, so each little bubble has NTPs, has its own reverse transcriptase enzyme. Yeah, we add that in. And this is also primed on polyade. I think, I think so, yeah. I don't have that in here, but I believe it's primed on polyade. So it's a polyade primed capturing the only three prime. So we actually capture uh, when this gets labeled, the UMI gets labeled on the, I think it's the three prime end. And then um, the sample index is annealed to the five prime end. You know, I'm talking about of the mRNA itself. Yeah. Your own, this is a three C protocol. Yeah. Right. This so is three prime. Yes. Yeah, so you just are getting the last exon of the gene. Yes, you, you are. You're not getting mRNA. no, no. So there are. Um, so if people are worried about that, um, there are different kits. So this is just for this walkthrough. It's they're using Tenex's typical single cell RNA seq kit with three prime end. You can also get a kit that will have the five prime end. Um, but if you're wanting to get the full mRNA, mRNA transcript, you need to use something like SmartSeq or SmartSeq2, which will um, get the whole transcript. So you will be losing information. So it is, um, there are a bunch of short reads, but where you have, where you, they try to make that up is with significant depth or with depth coverage. So you have many copies, you amplify the cDNA, but you're only gonna be amplifying what is kind of already on that three prime end. So mm -hmm. Is that's that a like random factor. Hexmer prime? Pardon? Is that just like random Hexmer prime? I don't know. Okay. I don't know, actually, no. But um, yeah, so that's something to consider. So if you are preparing to do single cell transcriptomics and you're worried about, um, if you're looking at certain genes you're kind of hoping to pick up, see how the, uh, look at the, different exons that are important to kind of know your biology for whether you might choose to want to have a five prime based um, kit rather than three prime. Uh, but this this example, so this one, it would be three prime, but this same sort of technique that I'm walking through is the same thing for five, five prime. It's just slightly different chemistry as a result. And with 10X, the three prime one is um, just slightly better uh, for um, picking up all the information you want to pick up than the five prime one. Yeah, slightly more read up the three prime sequencing than five prime, but it's very marginal. And so if you're 
wanting to make sure you capture things on the five prime end, I would say use the five prime kit. So that's where knowledge of um, the genes that you're interested in um, would be useful in influencing what you pick for doing an experiment with single cell transcriptomics. However, if you do SmartSeq2 or anything that does the full transcriptome, which is starting to become something I've been eyeing, um, that's a way to kind of fix that. Awesome. Thumbs up if everyone's data is downloaded. And good question. Thank you. Awesome. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Zoom people, thumbs up. Kate, awesome. Anyone else? Or are you guys still downloading? Okay, good, good, good. Okay, I'm seeing three. All right, we're gonna keep going forward. Any other questions on this at this point? Because we will circle back to this sort of stuff next session. Okay, we'll keep going. All right. Okay, so check the data, make sure you have uh, these three new folders that have appeared in your data directory. So um, one of them is tiny. This is um, a tiny BCL data set that is put forth by Tonex Genomics. So that way you can um, basically test their functions with it. So tiny can't be used for cell range or count pipeline as it's actually, it's too small for it. Um, so you can still use it to test your script though. And we're actually gonna do that, um, but you won't get any results from the count output, but we're gonna use it to test make fast Q. Um, so the count function, by the way, then takes in FASTQ files um, and basically takes in the FASTQ files and then that's going to align them to a reference transcriptome. It also does a little bit of quality control, getting rid of um, empty droplets um, or background mRNA that uh, things that don't seem like cells, it's going to get rid of those as well. So it does some quality control. Um, for your data set as well. How that all works to me is a black box with this um, proprietary software, but um, that's what it does. The other thing it does is the outputs of the cell ranger uh, count function are going to produce um, the files that you need to make a gene expression matrix. So that's where if you're using FASTQ files downloaded from a repository that um, were prepared using a 10x kit, then you can use this count function to align the fast cues to a reference transcriptome and then take it into our studio and do your analysis. You just use star and salmon. Yeah. Star and salmon. Yeah. I think, but for the, I don't know. All the other stuff. All the others, all the anything, it gets rid of some of the labeling and things that it identifies based on what you put in chemistry wise with the kit you were using. It uses that information to remove that stuff. And that's the part I don't know. So Anyways, for um, the cell ranger count function, we're going to be using this PDMC's C data set. Um, and it's a small 500 cell low throughput PDMC data set. Um, I might refer to it just as C, data set C for this. Um, and we've downloaded the FASTQ files needed for it as well. So usually um, this format, you will. this is the format you'll get when you download from online repositories. Um, you likely won't have to run make FASTQ for single cell RNA sequence data unless you, um, until you have recently sequenced BCL files or you've inherited some BCL files. All right, PBMCX or dataset X is going to be used at the tail end of today. So we're actually gonna use it in the second workshop today to integrate with our PBMCC data set. Now, the key difference between these two data sets is just the machine that the microflutic chip was loaded onto. That's all. Same cell type, potentially even same donor. It's still from that 25 to 30 year old Bay female donor um, and has about 500 ish cells it says recovered. Um, but it loaded on us uh, about 1600 cells. So, almost two data sets, even from the same total donor, but different cells for sure. Yeah, so they would have had to be actually different cells because they would have been loaded onto different machines. And you can't reuse the cells once they've been loaded on machines. So I, I was also, I wondered that for a split second, whether it was actually the same cells because the data actually looked very, very similar to itself uh, once I got further down and to what we'll see this afternoon, but they are different cells. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right, so let's get started with the tiny data set. So open up the tiny folder and look inside. So here you're gonna have your compressed, um, tar.gzz file, um, and then you'll have 
we won't really touch that. We have our open file, so our Cell Ranger tiny BCL file, and then we also have our tiny BCL uh, simple sample sheets. So the middle folder contains the BCL files. Um, you can open it up. It has information stored in it about the machine sequencing, uh, like what machine it was done on and other details. Um, in the data folder are the BCL files. You can dig for that later if you want to go and look, but for today, we're just gonna kind of keep moving forward. Um, right now though, we have one out of two items we need to run the make fast pipeline. So that one thing being the BCL files. And then don't delete these other files either. If you ever are wondering, keep those after you sequence. Um, the second important item is the sample sheet. Uh, this simple sample sheet here is provided with the tiny uh, data download. So you can look at it and you'll see that it's just very simple. You have your lane in column one sample and then your index. So your lane is going to refer to the lanes on the flow cell, which will depend on the sequencing machine you use. Uh, for the next Seq 500 at BCCHR, it's actually has it's four lanes on your flow cell. So you're basically going to have the same thing in this line here, except then the same thing will be line two. So let me two comma test sample comma your index three comma test sample comma your index. And so you repeat that process four times for one sample, and then switch to the next sample and go one two three four again for the next sample and the next index. So yeah. Lane depends on the flow cell used. The library is what you want to call your library, for example, donor one, donor two, and that labor library name is then associated with the FASTQ file outputs, as you'll see here. So, or if you do your library preparation yourself, um, you'll actually have to make one like this. Um, it is straightforward CSV, so you can make it using cat and the greater, the greater than sign, name it, and then you can enter in and use Linux to just write out uh, what you would put here. Uh, the most important part of this process though is to remember um, when you do your library preparation, what the sample index is. And so the kits you're using in the protocol will tell you how to identify on the plate you use for identifying um, these indexes, it'll tell you what the naming scheme is. Usually it's um, like A, B, C, D, E over the top, and then one, two, three, four down the line. And so it'll be like single index, so S, I, G, A, that's the plate name. Um, and then A2 would be that first uh, row, second column. So it's important to remember that because this is basically the tag that differentiates sample to sample when you run this function. All right, so now we're gonna go into the command and components for Cell Ranger make fast Q. So um, now that we know what we need and where it is, I want you guys to go to our data folder or go to your Cell Ranger folder. And this is where I put the scripts. I wrote these so you guys can basically go in, change your file path for what you're using, and run this pipeline on Sockeye. So pop over to Cell Ranger, type in ls, and see what's in there. And we've got these three scripts. So um, let's look at the make fastq tiny script. And for this, we're going to hit, we're going to use vi. So we're going to enter vim so we can edit it as well. So once you're in vim, you should be able to scroll up and down and take a look at the script. All right, um, after that, you can exit Vim first. We're just gonna run this even though it's very quick. Um, so to exit Vim, you're going to do, as long as you didn't hit the I key, do uh, semicolon or colon Q to quit. And it should take you right back to your folders that you were in. Can I get a thumbs up that everyone got in and out easily? Because I don't think we've done Vim yet. Yeah, good. Okay, please change your... Yeah, perfect. And Alejandro is a step ahead of the game. Um, yeah, basically go in. You can change your email um, if you want, and which I would prefer. And then the next step is we're going to run the makefastq tiny.sh script. 
Okay, so for that, you're gonna do Q sub. So this is now we're using Q submit, make fast Q tiny.sh. And this is because um, as kind of brought up earlier, we are telling what resources we need to run this function um, through PBS, I believe it's called. All right, once that's run, give me a thumbs up that you submitted it properly and you got a value over on the left side with this sock, I think, perfect, good. Zoom, you're good. Okay, I'm trusting that you guys are good, good. Okay, so let's go back into the make uh, fast Q shiny or make fast Q tiny dot sh. Okay, so these, um, your wall time up here, you do not want to change as part of the script. Um, and then the things I've highlighted here, these are your error and out logs, and these are going to appear in your cell ranger folder after you've submitted this. Um, this is going to be nice because you'll be able to go in and check and see what the status of what you submitted is. So whether it worked, whether it didn't. So we'll go look at those in a bit. Um, Next thing, um, if you didn't, you probably didn't because we skipped over this, but um, in the future, please update your email as Alejandro said. And if you are to do that now, I want you to press your I key. So you're in edit mode and then scroll over, change your email. And then once you've done that, after you're in edit mode, um, hit command control C to oh, very quickly, yes. <laughs> you can use nano. You can also use, can we on this one? Yeah, okay. Nano well, is what we've been using. Uh, okay, well, this is a very quick, quick and dirty glance at them. So once you've changed it, control C out of it. And that's also one way you can go and change the file path. But if you're more familiar with nano, use nano. Um, control C to exit no, sorry, to exit edit mode, to exit edit mode. We're still going to be in BIM for a little bit just while we look at it. Yeah. All right, so everyone's out of edit mode now. Okay, we're going to move forward and we're just going to scroll down. So we're not going to edit anything else. So stay out of edit mode. Don't hit I, but scroll down um, to the modify the section and you're not going to modify it. So don't modify this because this is all currently uh, typed out. So it'll work with where we have our data right now. Is that a spelling mistake? Where? Studnet spaces? Potentially, yeah. I also have a concussion. <laughs> so, but your script should, your script will, uh, where does it say studnet spaces? Studnet spaces. Yeah, it should work for your guys and it's what you guys have on your script. So, okay. yeah, no, because it did run earlier today when I tested it. Give me a thumbs up if, or we'll find out if it's running, but it will run. Um, so these are screenshots from previous that I put on. This is not a live demonstration. Um, okay, so the file paths that we're actually going to update um, to change if you have data in another location are going to be your job working directory. Awesome. Thanks, Alejandro. So um, it's your job working directory. So this is um, essentially what is go I'm going to be using to where you want the um, outputs of this function to be placed. So right now we have um, it sending to our data folder. And then we have our tiny data folder, which we all saw. And so we're going to be putting the outputs in our tiny data folder. Um, so the next thing that we'll want is to update the folder containing where your sequencing outputs actually are. And so this is going to depend after you do your sequencing and you have your results, uh, depend where you put them on your uh, on Sockeye, on your scratch base on Sockeye. So if you do this yourself, this is where you want to point to where your sequencing reads are in the sequencing read directory. This should all be pretty clear. Um, the next thing is going to be your sample sheet. And this you will have to write after you do your sequencing, it won't be automatic for you. So you'll have to write that and put it in a folder as well. Um, and then this is where you refer to it here. So again, the sequencing read directories, that's your BCL files. This is big component number one. The second one is your sample sheet, basically telling the function, the pipeline here, really what is what, and that's big input number two. So these are the two critical parts. And with this script, it's very simplified then for what needs to be inputted 
used. And then the function at the bottom of the script will use them. Um, the last little bit is going to be the name of the folder that the FASTQ files will end up in your job working directory. So I called this one tiny fast cues. Yes. So your sample sheets that pretty much assign the like index to a single name. Yeah, so that's that, all it does. So that when you get the fast queued files, they are already they've already been adjusted to say yeah. that they've been named essentially. Okay, cool. So it's basically just putting a name to the index that was assigned to that sample. So it's going from some two letter dash, two letter dash, two letter. Uh, string to become an actual name so you can identify your data yeah. yourself and then also so that the next function the count function can identify the data it's and how would you like format something like that would, it, would there like when you submit samples and they send you like a template sample sheet and you can like name them as you submit. what do you mean by submit samples like, where would you get the sample sheet um like the you, excel sheet that you, make? you make it yourself so you can actually you can even make it in excel save it as a CSV, and then put it on your folder that you then put into your scratch base on Sockeye. Um, there's a million ways to make it, but it's just a CSV. So as long as you have your um, your lane, and should say lane, sample, and then index, and then underneath lane would be the what lane you so one, two, three, four, and then the name, and then the index. So that's all it is. So it can be, you can make it in the, like in terminal, or you can make it yourself, yeah. Thank you. Okay, sweet. Any other questions? Anything online? Perfect. All right. All right. So scroll down to Cell Ranger Make Fast Q on Tiny Data Example section. And um, these right here, this is the function that's actually going to be used. Um, there are other things you can add into this, uh, and feel free to look these up. Uh, we've got resources at the end of this slide, as well as on GitHub, um, to learn more about the Cell Ranger Make Fast Cube function. But for me, when I use it, these are really the only these are the only lines I use. But then again, I'm also just doing, um, yeah, it's pretty. I keep it pretty simple and straightforward. So, um, so you have your function here. So Cell Ranger Make Fast Q, and then your ID is going to be that Make Fast Q ID. Um, so that's going to be what you call this. So for us, it's going to spit it out as tiny fast queues. Here we have your local cores and local memory. Don't change these values. Um, right now for this size of data set, this is way more than we would need typically for this data set, but this is what the pipeline is configured for. Um, and this, so this is what we have here for this, for this, what we're using. Yes. So these memory cores and the memory can we you just you just manage the less that that will not work, but can we ask for more and then for more cores or more? You shouldn't need more than this for this function, I would say. Okay. Um you really so shouldn't this is all already tried all op yeah. optimized. So this is the best from configuration. This is what um this is what Cell Ranger okay. suggests to use for this um this part of the function. Um, I haven't tested on yeah. Sockeye to see what is the best or the fastest, mostly because that would be a lot of resources and time that I don't have. Um, but no, it hasn't been optimized on Sockeye, but um, it is usually this function when run um, takes about 20 minutes to half an hour. So it doesn't take long um, with this configuration. And that's pretty, that's pretty standard. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Bill, do you want to comment? Yeah, so yeah. I mean, there's certain plateaus that you can hit yeah. when you're trying to multi thread So if you were to bump from 12 cores to 24 cores, you might not see a double increase in speed, right? So there's there's usually a plateau of how much extra performance you can get. Some of that's IO, some of it's handling RAM, some of it's you know, how it's actually distributing across the cores. So, you know, if this is a configuration that works and runs quickly, and time is not of insane essence, then I think this is. Yeah, right now I would just say like, knowing how big this data set is, it's tiny, uh, literally, uh, that's too much, but I tried to do it with less and oh. it didn't work. I, I got the error that it needs a certain minimum requirement for this pipeline, so. All right, next slide. Um, so. To exit Vim, you just hit semicolon, 
WQ, this stands for writes and quits. Them. We're going to be using them basically the whole day. Um, but that's essentially the main commands we're using. And if you're not comfortable with them, you can also just use You can nano. use nano, yeah. Right. And it's instead of having to deal with two parts. Yeah. Nano is just simpler, I think, for something. I, yeah, I prefer nano, but yeah, do do nano. Just I did this all in Vim because I don't think we had nano on BCCHR. Because I every time I tried to use it, it oh. no, we yeah. Um, so I'm happy we have it on Sockeye. All right, so um, you have submitted it. Um, you're in your Cell Ranger folder right now. You all should be. Um, so run it if you haven't ran it yet. Um, if you have ran it, good job. You're following along. It usually takes again, yeah, 20 to 45 minutes really depending on your configuration and how busy things are, I would say really it's it's done within like half an hour. Um, so let's see how it's doing. So type cat and then the standard out log. So st out log. And you also need the squiggly brackets for this. So type that verbatim. This one probably took about a minute actually. Um, so nice and quick. And then here are outputs. So everyone should be able to see this when you open this. So you have your fast queue output folder. Um, oh, first, yeah, you'll always see Cell Ranger is very clear. It always ends with waiting six seconds for UI to do final refresh, and then it'll tell you if it completed it successfully. So that's how you know, super clear. Um, so your first bit that you're going to see are your fast queue output folder. So um, this is the file path to what was made. And of course, it's putting this output folder in our tiny fast queues as we asked for. So let's go over to our fast queue function. Um, let's go look at the fast queue function outputs that it shows us. So while you guys pop over there, um, the interop output folder um, you're not really going to use, but I, I actually don't know what it does. Um, so that one you don't really have to worry about, but what it does do is it also makes a copy of the input sample sheet and puts it in your outs folder as well. So you can go back if you had any issue or error or something, you'll see what it used as a sample sheet that you gave it. It will be at verbatim. Um, so you can see it in this convenient location to see if you messed that up. And I would say most times when Cell Ranger make fast queue doesn't run properly. It's because the index you typed in was not the correct index, and therefore it found no states that were um, or no nothing that matched that sample index that you put in. So you always want to make sure that that's accurate, and then make sure it's also configured properly um, as a very simple CSV. All right, so go. You should be in your tiny fast queues folder now. And then you're going to pop over to your outs folder Sorry, within thanks. the tiny fast queues folder. Thank you. And so you're going to see here, just as we see up here in purple, um, that following that path, we have our fast queue path. Does everyone have this? Good. Thumbs up. Thumbs up, Zoom. Awesome. Otherwise, I'll assume the worst. Awesome. That's a lot of thumbs. Good. Okay, good. So that means that this function ran properly. You're seeing the things you want to see. You have your output um, now that can be used for um, Cell Ranger count. So now we're going to go in to do that um, with just a, a basically a template to go from make fast queue directly into count as well. And we're going to be using this tiny data set for this. So go back to your Cell Ranger folder. Once you're there, um, use nano or VI, but basically just open your make fast queue, uh, not your make fast queue tiny script, but your make fast queue and count template. So if you're generating your reads yourself, um, there's no point having two scripts when you can put them together into one and keep things simple. Um, so now press I or just edit your email with nano or press I to get into edit mode with them and update your email. Please change it from mine. I'm getting a lot of emails. You don't? Are you in make fast queue and count template.sh? 
You might have to scroll down a bit. It's like, uh, there's like, uh, hashtag, hashtag PBS, and then there's like four of them, like it's the fourth one. I, I haven't seen it in my Maybe you already took it out. Maybe I already took it out. I know I was trying to. You don't, <laughs> you don't need it. Yeah. yeah. Just so you know. Perfect. Your, I think your email address is in a difference if you don't know about it. I'll find out quick. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. If you don't have to edit the email, don't edit the email. Um, essentially, I just don't want to get spammed. Yes. I see. Yeah, you see an email? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I have my own. Okay. So once you've updated the email, um, we're going to type WQ and quit um, them or exit nano while saving it. And then we're going to submit this as well. And so to run the make fast and count template script, um, it's the same thing. So you're gonna use Q sub and then submit that file, okay? Once it's submitted, we're gonna go um, back and we're just gonna use VI to look at it or you can use nano. So basically open up the script so we can take a look. Um, and we're basically going to talk about how this feeds into how make fast queue feeds into count with the script. So it's very clear. You're going to be able to see um, what you want to update. So your job working directory should stay the same um, as before, but you can, if you were pulling files from a different location, change it. Um, you can update and put the sequencing read directory still to point to where your sequencing reads are coming from. Your sample sheet to so still point to your, your sample sheet, your original sample sheet. Um, the parts that should be the same, that absolutely have to be the same, basically, between these two functions is going to be your make fast QID or what you've named that folder. Um, the other thing that you'll need to update is going to be um, your sample ID, which is test sample. So this is in our CSV that we made. This is what we named our. Um, library. This is what we named our samples, basically. So this is a sample. And then you want to put in a name for what the count, cell ranger count output will be, the name of that folder. And that's going to be, I'm going to call it teeny out. So we have from tiny to teeny. So um, scroll down a little more and you can see the make fast queue function. This is the same as I had before. And most importantly, we're going to pop over to that cell ranger uh, count function. So count, it's going to um, bring in your name. So what you're going to call um, the basically what you're going to call this, you've got your reference transcriptome that is in the file as well. And that one, you don't really want to change um, the file path for it because it shouldn't move, but um, you can switch between the mouse and human transcriptomes. And you'll see that in the in the script itself. So comment out which one you don't want to use, comment in which one you want to use. Um, so for this one, it's human. You have your fast cues, you have your sample ID. Um, another important thing to put in here is going to be your expected number of L's. And this is what Cell Ranger is going to, Cell Ranger count will also base its quality control kind of parameters off of a little bit. So if you load two cells and you put that you expect 500 cells, it's not going to work. Um, something weird will happen because that doesn't make any sense. Um, but if you put in 20,000 cells that you loaded onto the chip and you're expecting 20,000 cells, that's fair to put in. With this example, we loaded 1,675 cells and we're expecting 500. And so depending on the biology of the cell, like depending on the cells you're using, you might actually expect to have a higher percentage of cells maintained. So the reason why this is like, we're expecting a third of the cells essentially that were loaded is likely because these are PBMCs. So it's got some fragile immune cells that were loaded on this chip, put through this process of a lot of ethanol washes and um, mostly because they were put on the chip and they might not have all survived. So Cell Ranger will kind of filter out some of the dead cells. So this value needs to be determined quote unquote, empirically. Um, basically what I mean by that, that is take, consider the biology of like what cells you're using when you run this function. How accurate is it even when you're loading uh, 
like you thought it was 1600 cells. That's what they said. <laughs> they thought it was 16. So if they think it's six, I mean, there's even an error on that. Yeah. Too. So that's a great question. That would be the kind of upper bound for what you put and then scaling it back. Does yeah. it make much of a difference if you put 1600 here instead? I usually put that I expect the amount that I put in. Okay. The reason for that is because of the cells I'm working with as well. I'm working with macrophages. They're also super fragile. They like to stick to plastic and this chip is plastic. Um, so I also am working with very, 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 very low cell numbers. So when you load the chip, first of all, when you load the chip, the amount that you put on at a certain concentration and the amount you think you loaded needs to be known. You can overload the chip and cause it to basically get a clog and then that's going to mess things up. Um, but you also don't want to overload it and have too many cells with one gem, which is an issue we'll talk about this afternoon. Um, you don't want cells, like my cells like to also stick together. And when cells die, they like to stick together. You don't want that happening because that can also cause errors. And so cell range or function will kind of filter out things like that a little bit with this count pipeline. But um, yeah, you need to make sure you know how many are loaded. Um, part of the reason is for not clogging the chip. The other part of the reason is for when we go through and filter and do the quality control on these. Um, so when I ran this sneak peek, we ended up getting like 700 or something cells when I ran this, even though I entered expecting 500 cells. Let's keep that in mind. Um, and I think it kind of depends on, it depends on the version of Cell Ranger you're also using, I would say. So I'm we're using this all with the latest version of Cell Ranger. Um, that takes introns into account, which previous versions didn't. The one that this version, the version used when they said they expected 500 cells, and I believe they got about 500 cells, was version 6.1, which um, doesn't consider introns unless you tell it to. And I don't think that when they ran through this as an example, they told it to. Um, so for cell ranger seven, we don't have to tell it to, it'll consider the intron. So it actually ended up getting a greater cell yield as a result. Um, so the filtering was a little less aggressive. So that's a very good question. So yeah, that's where the biology and bench kind of pulls into the bioinformatics. Um, local cores, local memory, I wouldn't change them. This function is going to take a anywhere from, I've had anywhere from four to eight hours to run. Um, it can take a long time. So we're obviously not gonna run the whole thing with our PBMC data set today, um, but we're gonna run it with Tiny. And if you remember from earlier today, I said that wouldn't work. <laughs> so it's not gonna work, you're gonna get an error, but uh, the error that you wanna see is basically that there weren't enough FASTQ files for the cell range account function. All right, so any other questions on cell ranger count or anything about how the script is formatted? Is it all pretty intuitive and clear? Everything's written well? Good, good. This is that the biggest takeaway are these scripts. All right, so exit out of that. Can you talk about where you got the rec data? Yeah, so that's a good question, Phil. Um, so the reference data actually came from transcription. Scrims, bleh, transcriptomes on the 10 genomics website. So um, yeah, that's, that's it. So to download it, you'll have to go in. Anyone can download these transcriptomes. Anyone can download Cell Ranger software uh, from 10X. Sometimes it'll make you just like enter in your name, email, phone number, uh, what institution you're with, just so they can get you on the marketing email list. You can not press a box, not select a box to not get on that list. Um, but other than that, anyone can download these transcriptomes and they are in the location indicated on the script, on the script. So you guys are able to access those. They do only have them for mouse and human though. That's all. No other, no other organisms, but you can put on, put in other reference transcriptomes. It should work the same way. All right. So let's pop over to our Cell Ranger folder. So exit Vim, exit Nano, whatever you want to exit, and you should be in your Cell Ranger folder. And now let's look at our standard, let's look at our Outlog. And if your Outlog looks the same as before, 
check your error log because then an error probably happened. But this is what your standard, this is what your log should look like for the outlog. And it's going to say pipe stance failed, error at, etc. cetera. Um, and it'll give you a message. So when you're going through using these scripts or maybe you're tailoring them for your own stuff and you get errors, they're pretty good at telling you what might have gone wrong. Um, and in this case, we don't have enough fast queues. The tiny data is way too tiny to run cell range or count. Um, yeah, so if there are any issues though, 10X is pretty good with their customer support. They're not bad with their customer support. So um, if anything does happen, you can run this command cell range or upload, type in your email, and then just put the file path um, to your teeny outs.mri.tj. GZ file, and that will basically send them the error that you received, and then they'll reach back out to you for how to fix that. Um, so that do that if you're looking through and after you've gone through your simple sample sheet and all of that's made and everything looks pristine and you can't figure it out, email them, ask them. The other issue is it might be something with the setup of the script. You all have my email by this point. Feel free to email me if you have any issues with it um, or with the script itself, because I'm probably going to be quick to help you with that. And if I don't know, I'll ask Phil. Um, okay. So we don't get the output there, um, but we're going to walk through how to do it. If, you're, if you've downloaded data and you want to just run the count function on a bunch of fast queues. This is also what you get from the PRC. No. They would count for you too. They count for you too. So from the BR, oh, I probably should have actually included that. So if you go to the BRC, which I think most people do to, for their sequencing, especially their single cell RNA sequencing, if you don't do the lab, people will do the library prep themselves, which I recommend, and then go there for sequencing, you get all the way down to a Surat object with monocle run on it even. But it's, um, it's a very automated process for how they do their thresholding. Um, that's standard across all different cell types, which might differ depend on what cells you have and how you should be thresholding things. Okay, so let's go to our PBMCC data set. Um, check out your fast queue files. And these are gonna be used as input for the cell ranger count function. The only thing cell ranger count needs are the fast queue files. So we've got, I think eight listed here and um, Let's see. Before we go forward, I just want you to see that um, basically this part up until here, until it starts going S3 L004, this part here is what was named as part of the make fast queue function. So this is what your simple, their simple sample sheet decided to name these. Okay. So Hop on over again. We're going to to your cell ranger directory and open your make fast queue. Uh, sorry, your PBMC count script. All right. So, of course, please update your email. Um, and we're not going to run this. Uh, so, please don't run it. You can if you want later tonight. You can totally disregard what I said and run it now too, if you'd like, um, if you really want to see the results. Um, so you want to change your job working directory. Yours should be proper for what um, your file path is, but basically your job working directory is where you want the outputs to be for this script. Um, new for the count function, you want to update um, to where your fast queue directory is located. So this has changed from before. Of course, we're pulling these files from where we downloaded our PBMCC data set to, and we have it formatted so that they downloaded into input files. Um, so that's where we're going to pull these from. The next bit is your sample ID. So you're going to change your sample ID to show what is basically the first part um, of your FASTQ file names. Yeah. Fast queue files are located in, um, if you go to your user single cell RNA seq folder, so user scRNA seq slash data slash PBMCs underscore C. Yeah. 
Are they before the Soul Ranger? No, they're outside. Oh, yeah, they're before. Yeah, they're before Soul Ranger so, Repository. Repository. Yeah. So, so these are signals that are already seen, and then data. Data. And then input files. Perfect. Did everyone else find them all right? Okay. So um, this is going to be your sample ID. So when you download them, they're going to have a big name. Basically, up until it says S3 and don't include the underscore, that's your sample ID. And this name, you have to copy exactly what they have. You get to name it in this next little bit under name. Okay. So here I'm going to name this PBMC's C out because it's the output of the count function. And this folder is going to end up in our data PBMC's C folder. Okay. And then down here, as I mentioned before, you're going to choose your human or mouse reference transcriptome. For so for this, it's human. Um, All right, so now I'm just going to show you what a su successful Cell Ranger count run looks like at the end, about six ish hours after submitting it, you can see if it's complete. So the output you're going to want to see is a list of the outputs you got. Um, these ones at the end are little extra features. So if you had, um, you did something with CRISPR with your single cell RNA sequencing, or you have um, feature barcodes attached as well. The outputs will be down here. And these are extra little things that you can do with Cell Ranger. Um, you can just add them to the function commands. Um, and there's references linked to look more into that. But if you're just doing just basic single cell RNA sequencing, you're going to get at a bare minimum all of these files in this file here. Um, so the first thing is going to be a run summary HTML. So that's actually going to show you online what, what your output looks like. Um, you'll have a CSV, you'll get your BAM files. I always like to include these because these can be used for other analyses. Um, but the ones that are going to be important are going to be um, your filtered um, MX data set. So here, filtered feature BC matrix. This is usually what um, gets inputted for single cell RNA sequencing analysis in our studio. It contains three files that will be made to create your um, gene expression matrix. They also have the HD5 files for other inputs. Um, yes, so again, of course, you'll see that it completed successfully and that's the results you want to see. So to confirm though, um, these files that we just, that I ran here, uh, when I ran Cell Ranger account earlier, should be the same files that you downloaded that are in your PBMCC's output fo files folder. So we're able to keep moving forward with the output files without having to run cell ranger counts because they were available to us. Okay. So for cell ranger outputs, we briefly discussed those. Um, let's go and make sure that they exist. For you guys, they won't, but um, we're gonna go to our PBMC it would show like PBMCC outs folder like that. Um, so to look at the contents of it, um, this is what it will contain. The main thing here we're gonna go into would be then your outs folder if we're following the file path I showed earlier. From there, we're gonna see all the outputs we got. So the raw feature BC matrix and the filtered BC matrix are what we're gonna use this afternoon. Um, but usually people just use the filtered BC matrix if you want to make a gene expression matrix in our studio with Surat. So these are the ones we're going to use for our afternoon workshop. But we shouldn't have those. You won't have them here. So you will have them. Now, if you go back to your output files folder, which I actually am going to nudge you guys to do right now, um, go to your output files folder and make sure that you have these files here. And if you do, Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, 
C. So you should have it. So uh, go to your, um, I can put out the full path. Oh, it's so if you go to your um, user folder and then into the single cell RNA seq folder, then you want to go into your data folder, followed by PBMC's underscore C folder. And then instead of going to the folder that would be made with cell range or count function that I made here, which is PBMC C out, so you're just going to go to output files. And this genome. Bam, you get it. Mm -hmm. That you could visualize by GB. Yeah, you can. And I've done it before because a reviewer asked me to. And do they, is there any coloring of the different cells or? No, no, it no. Just it just reads, just reads. That's also a good question. Yeah. That's a quick question. Was it that like dot EAI file? That is, I believe it's a compressed version of BAM. No, it's no. index. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's BAM with BAM, the index. BAM index. That's so what you would use for IGV. Most right. tools yeah. that are going to access data in BAM, because BAM is huge, big, you know, tens of gigabytes, sometimes hundreds of gigabytes. In order to pick a certain region out of the genome, say, let's, I want to look at chromosome X in, you know, some region. In order to get and retrieve that quickly, it uses an index. So it says that at this point in the BAM yeah, file, yeah. this is chromosome one, this is chromosome two, this is chromosome two. Yeah, it might not be in the same order. All right. Yeah. But yeah, as long as the contents are there. All of mine start with like 500 PMC, 3PLT chromium controller, and then they have the same. Yeah, and name. that's because that's the name that they gave the index. And whereas for our script, we sent it down a certain file path so it would be stored well, where it's, you can access it and we have it all there, whereas they just named them all from the get-go. And that's mostly because if you have a bunch of samples and you're looking at the same file for a bunch of different samples and the same file is raw feature BC matrix, raw feature BC matrix, me looking at it, I won't be able to tell what's what. So since they have multiple samples, they kept that name going through. Whereas instead we just have it in different folders. All right. So maybe this is getting ahead of No, you might but, not be. Um, once you have this uh these files that you can run it. And so pretty much what we've done is we've taken the uh MK Classic file and added uh sample names to them. Yes. So now we have the FASC files. Yes, we have okay. the FASC files, yep. And then how what would we need to do to have an analysis on that? Sorry to do Did we take would you go from there to BAM and then like go on like our studio and sort of like? That's kind of almost what we did. Yeah. So we basically went from the BCL files to the FASTQ files um, and then from FASTQ to these outputs we've made here. So we made that BAM file, we made that BAM dot BAM okay. dot BAI. And we've, and so you can use those for some things. And then we'll be using the filtered and raw. Uh, feature BC matrix matrices for our studio. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's awesome. This is great. Yeah. And it's very streamlined. Very, helpful. very streamlined. We like so streamlined. We've gone through this presentation pretty fast. Um, so if anyone has any more questions on this, please chime in. Um, Jane, can you hear me? We're missing PBMC C hours. Yes, that is because you did not run. So if you're missing this folder here, that's because, as I asked you to, you did not run um, cell range or count on the PBMC Z data set. That's okay. You have everything that you would have gotten as from PBMC C outs already in your output files. So we'll be using everything that's in the output files for this afternoon. Um, if you want to run cell range or uh, count, I don't know if it would overwhelm the system if everyone did it, but you guys are welcome to, to see if you, by this afternoon, by the time we finish, that you got the proper result you'd want. You're welcome to run that. I'm getting a nod-ish. I'm getting this from Phil. Yeah, you don't need to, but if you're really curious and you want to try it, try it, um, go for it. See, I feel like all the course skills stuff finally like came through for me today and like it's finally like streamlined. Okay. 
Okay, cool. So does anyone have any questions on Zoom or in the chat about anything regarding the single cell RNA sequencing, anything that has to do with library prep or going from the very beginning to where we are now? It seems too easy. I'm kind of scared. Like I it know is. I'm gonna try to do this and it's gonna, I'm gonna have so many issues. <laughs> It is, that was, yeah. So the main thing for this workshop that I kind of prepared was to create scripts so you can do this easily with editing and changing a very minimal amount of things because the amount of times I've had to troubleshoot with this stuff, the hour, the honestly weeks <laughs> I've lost, it's, it's pretty, it's a lot. So yeah, we did go through this presentation a lot faster than I expected. Um, everything, I think we should all be missing it because yes, good job, Irvin. Irvin's on it. Nice. Are amazing in the script. Like it's just gonna be so easy for us. Hopefully, hopefully. So run it, give it a shot. Um, if anyone does also have their own data that they want to try these functions on, please do it. Um, please do it and let me know how it works um, or feel free to download some fast cues from elsewhere. Um, I'm happy to update or change or tweak the scripts or even add onto them as needed um, during August. So highly encourage you guys to do that um, because the way you find errors is by testing things. Okay, so to summarize um, for most of today, because we are done early, um, here, yeah, good, yes, please. I'm just gonna check the slide of the files in the office. Uh, of the files. Mm -hmm. Seems that the low feature is larger than the filter feature. And uh, they ask, what kind of filter are they using? Like the size of the file shrink? Yeah, you know, that, that is a that's such a good question because this feeds directly into this afternoon. Oh, so, no, that's yeah. perfect. That's great. So, um, I'll give you guys, I'll tell you a little bit about the difference. Um, the difference, the difference between these two files. So, as I mentioned briefly, um, or to summarize for Zoom too, the question was, why is the raw feature BC matrix so big uh, compared to the filtered BC matrix? Um, and the filtered BC matrix is what is usually inputted directly into R to create your gene expression matrix. Um, however, we what we'll be doing this afternoon is using both of these because the raw feature BC matrix is exactly that. It's the unfiltered, um, completely raw contents that were aligned to the reference transcriptome, whereas the filtered one is filtered. So the raw one is going to contain any little mRNA transcript. If, if there was a bubble, a gem that contained everything, everything, it, if it had like just the slightest little blip of mRNA in it, because maybe a cell was stressed and had gotten rid of some of its mRNA, which ambient, background noise mRNA happens a lot when cells are stressed and are dying as part of this process. They let that out. Then a gem will encapsulate it and it will get transcribed. So anything that has like maybe, maybe there's just like two strands tagged to one quote unquote cell because it was tagged to one of those gel beads, it will get transcribed. It will get sequenced and it will end up in our raw data. But obviously, it's not a whole cell because it's one strand of mRNA. So that stuff gets filtered out, oh, or any empty okay. droplets as well that contain like part, like anything will get filtered out. So what we do at the start of this afternoon is we're gonna to get rid of extra ambient mRNA that's in the background that looks like a cell according to the cell ranger count function. We're gonna compare the filtered and the raw. BC matrices and use that comparison to figure out, okay, what's what was considered a cell, what wasn't considered a cell, and kind of based on that comparison, take out any extra cells that might have, might not actually be a full cell that were missed by cell ranger count and remove them. And that's part of this other package we'll use. Okay. That's a very good question. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Cool. I have a question. Yeah. Could you go to your next slide? Yeah. In your... okay. So back to the, you know, the cell is next to this bead. Yes. How do you get the RNA out of the cell? We um, lice, we basically, RNA, I believe there's, we lice the cells somehow. And so. In the bubble? In the bubble. 
I don't, it's part of the enzyme that gets, that's part of the master. I'll go back to it. Yeah. Okay. Essentially. Just burst it. Literally, you like, you don't, not even in the bubble. At first, the cell, like, they both pop somehow within the bubble. Okay. To put it very simply okay. um, and visually. So, uh, when you load your gel beads, the partitioning oil, and the cells, the cells are loaded with um, a master mix that contains an enzyme that will basically break down the cell wall. Okay. Okay. So it chews up the cell wall and then it. I, I believe guess, all the mRNA. Or it's only no. working in cytosol. cytosol. Yeah. So that's so a different thing that you can do too is um, nuclear single cell RNA sequencing of just the nucleus. So that's another thing as well. So with that step, you have to ice you somehow separate out just the nucleus and then the same process occurs, except it would be opening the nuclear, the nucleus. Yeah. Um, oh, my lab's doing that. We're going to compare um, Alzheimer's brain, my, my brains to non, and we're trying to see if there's a biomarker. Wait, which lab are you? So did, uh, the Wolf Jenkins lab. Okay. I thought you were saying this for a second. And um, we're looking at nuclei, single nuclei data and single yes. cell. Single, yes, single cell. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to compare the two. Yeah. I was wondering if you guys have any, like, I guess that's like if you want the total mRNA expression, that's the way to get it. It just, um, I guess it's just like to do both. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah
cDNA has two labels, one indicating the cell it came from and the other indicating the sample. And from the bioinformatics side, these are both important to basically differentiate what mRNA came from what cell, and then also what, what cell that this, what sample that cell then came from. Next slide, there we go. So, yeah. You can have these be different samples. Okay. Um, or the same sample that you had yeah, in different depends, conditions. Depends on the design of the experiment. Depends on the design. Okay. Yeah, it okay. could be replicates. So if you're wanting to get a lot of cells, you can load the same sample into all eight wells of the chip. And sometimes that actually has to happen because there is a maximum limit of cells and the concentration you can put into one channel okay. on the chip. So uh, if you want to get a bunch of cells, you can do replicates. You okay. can run two totally different samples on the same chip though. Okay. That's totally okay. The chip keeps them separate. Okay. Um, and then of course the make fastq pipeline turns the sequence BCL files into fastq files and then labels them by sample library. And lastly, count aligns make fastq files to a reference transcriptome and creates outputs for analysis, which we'll be analyzing this afternoon. So that's our key takeaways from this session. Up next, I just have a slide linking all of the resources. And so if you're wanting to learn more about other like things you can add into the make fast queue or count functions, um, you can follow those links. Uh, to understand more about the cell ranger outputs um, that we've covered today, follow this link at the bottom. And of course, the very top, the fast queue files explained if you want to know um, a little bit more about the Illumina sequencing outputs and why we basically want to go from the BCL files to fast queue files. Okay, so that's all I have for this morning. Um, do you have anything to add or anything to elongate? Uh, maybe one question. What's yeah. uh, How many cells can you put on the chip? I'm gonna have to, uh, it's a certain, I'm gonna have to do math, but it's going to be, so I can probably answer that by this afternoon. I have to pull up a few tables. Um, maybe but, didn't let me add it in the ballpark. 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million. Um, 50,000, 80,000-ish, cool. it's pretty, it's pretty large amount, right. uh, yeah, you can All get right. a lot.